Good morning, everybody. Thank you for taking the time as always to join us. I'm Mike Albertson. I'm the deputy director here at the Center for Global Security Research at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. And we're going to talk a little bit today about extended deterrence, um, which is one of the most complex topics, I think, in the deterrence landscape we cover here at, at CGSR. Um, one, it's always useful to explore and engage on more deeply. Um, to me, I think to a lot of people in the deterrence world, extended deterrence is, is always fascinating, um, simply because it's something that's dynamic and it's always changing. Um, it has a great deal of associated sort of political science theory um, associated with it. Uh, it can be very ally specific or even very allied government specific. Um, and it's one where you are always doing calculations, not only of assuring an ally in question, but also deterring a potential adversary in their actions against a potential ally. So we're very pleased uh, to be joined today um, by Dr. Rupal Mehta um, for her CGSR lecture, which is titled The Patron's Dilemma, uh, Recklessness and Restraint Under Nuclear Umbrellas. And this talk, as she'll explain, is, is based on a larger project she's been working on for a number of years. Um, and I think we're interested both to hear her, her perspective, her research on the topic, but hopefully um, she can encourage the audience to engage and provide a little feedback to her on the project. Just a little bit about the, the speaker. Uh, Dr. Mehta is an associated, associate professor in the Department of Political Science at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln. Um, and she's currently a faculty fellow with the Nebraska Strategic Research Institute and a research collaborator at the Center for Peace and Security Studies, or CPAS. Uh, if you look her up online, though, she actually has a much more extensive biography than that. Um, she's, she's written uh, for a number, of, a number of journals in the field. She's written two books on the topic. Um, if you want to plug those two books, you, you certainly can. Um, and she's been an advisor to a number of uh, government institutions and other think tanks. So um, she's, she's been very modest in what she sent to me to read in her, her profile, but she's, she's done a lot more than that. Um, a reminder on ground rules. Um, she's going to deliver her remarks for about 30 to 45 minutes, uh, at which point we'll open the floor for discussion. You know, raise your hand electronically if, if you can in WebEx or submit your questions in the chat function um, to me and we'll get the discussion rolling quickly and we'll try to get as much uh, conversation in as possible at the end of the remarks. So, Dr. Mehta, thank you so much for being with us today. Uh, over to you for your presentation. Great. Thank you so much, Mike, for this introduction um, and a special, sorry. Um, and especially thanks to uh, those at CGSR for the invitation to present today. Um, I also want to uh, issue a special thanks to John Scott over at Los Alamos for his support on this project um, and for working so extensively with Neil and I um, on each aspect of this manuscript. And um, we're still in the revision process of, of the overarching book project, uh, but we are very much hoping that it'll be under review soon with um, Cornell University Press, hopefully later this year or the next. So the motivation for this project um, actually began with what we thought was for many years um, a waning interest in alliances, even among leaders and other key decision makers. And what we really sort of took from um, an observation of the international of the international system was that policymakers, especially in you know in this photo, President Trump, were really in effect backsliding from security cooperation. But this began actually even before President Trump. Um, President Obama, for example, took aim at the special relationship with Great Britain and the United States, saying free riders aggravate me. President Trump then called NATO obsolete and suggested that the United States should really reconsider its um, relationship with NATO, that NATO is unfair, um, and it really should do more than um, to help than it currently does, especially than, more than the United States. Similarly, Bob Gates repeatedly criticized European allies for free riding, and academic scholar Dick Samuels referred to security guarantees as attempting to encourage reckless driving. No doubt things have, have really changed in the past year. And while those voices still persist in government and academia, there's been a resurgence in at least in some parts of the policymaking and academic communities in the importance of alliances and security commitments. 
But it's really this divergence in perspective that drives the main puzzles that we are examining in this book manuscript, both theoretical and empirical. Um, and this has largely been due to the fact that to date, there's been relatively weak evidence uh, and limited evidence that alliances do indeed lead to moral hazard and an increased likelihood of conflict. The majority of this evidence comes from an examination of conventional military alliances like um, Michael Beckley's fantastic work in 2015. In that work, he argued that conventional defense pacts actually help to create restraint and prevent recklessness. And in his sort of exhaustive analysis of US alliances, he finds very little evidence of entanglement, only in a few cases. And indeed argued that the really the only way to build a powerful case for entanglement theory is to commit serious methodological errors. This work was followed up by some more recent and significant work on nuclear umbrellas or on nuclear defense packs that comes from the Furman and Sexer book in 2013, where their research argues that there is not clear evidence that allies or client states of nuclear powers become emboldened. And really what they suggest is that nuclear defense pacts or these agreements have a, have a constraining effect where clients are really worried about losing the patron's trust or their willingness to actually assist in the event of a crisis um, because they're worried about losing those security guarantees or other forms of commitment. So before I, I continue, I want to sort of go over a few of the key definitions that I think are helpful here, in part because I use some of these words interchangeably. For example, when we talk about nuclear umbrellas, this is one form of an alliance commitment that we sometimes use alongside terms like nuclear security assistance, nuclear defense pact, or other commitments to extend deterrence to protect an, a client state or an ally. Notably, all of this and all of the sort of related debates about the value of alliances are happening in the shadow of nuclear weapons, marking this type of alliance um, and its dynamic as distinct from conventional alliances where there's only a commitment to use conventional weapons to defend an ally. And lastly, to date, most of the discussions about alliances include concerns about perverse side effects like moral hazard or recklessness amongst uh, client states. And indeed, it is this debate about the side effects that leads to the key research questions that we pursue in this project. Um, so I'm going to give out some of the questions that sort of stem from both parts of the book, and I'll, I'll get into that in just a moment. So first, has the American nuclear umbrella actually motivated or encouraged client states or allies to press their claims more than they otherwise would have without U.S. support? Second, and more broadly, do commitments to extended deterrence create moral hazard that leads client states to become more emboldened or reckless because they know the patron will come to their aid? And lastly, if this is indeed happening, and there again is some debate about whether or not this is happening, um, can patrons design these institutions and defense facts to adequately mitigate these risks and reduce the likelihood of conflict and entrapment? So to answer these questions, we argue that the same mechanisms that actually help extended deterrence work in the first place can indeed increase the risks of moral hazard. But rather than seeing it in the overarching increase in the likelihood of war or escalation to war, it's most likely to appear in some diplomatic and bargaining outcomes that we might observe. To manage these risks, patrons can design alliance institutions to limit their commitment and encourage restraint. But most importantly, and I think one of the more counterintuitive claims that we make in this project is that mitigating this risk requires that patrons induce uncertainty about the strength of their commitment that actually makes deterrence work. We call this the patron's dilemma. At the same time, they're sort of pulling two distinct levers that can both reduce the likelihood of entrapment and entanglement and costly conflict, but also potentially weaken the deterrent effect of the alliance itself. 
So this research is actually, as I mentioned at the outset, part of a larger book project that was supported um, and generously sponsored by John Scott and the Director's uh, Strategic Resilience Initiative in the National Security International Studies Office at Los Alamos. And this book actually delves into what we sort of consider both sides of this coin. The question of moral hazard and recklessness among allies and how to help induce restraint through institutional design. I'll present some theory and empirics from both parts of the book, and I'm more than happy to answer questions about um, the quantitative and qualitative evidence that we're marshalling um, in both parts. So in trying to um, answer some of these questions and, and to look into both aspects, the, the recklessness, and recklessness of allies and, and how best to restrain them, we're really building on some excellent and rich existing scholarship that explores the benefits um, such as the aggregation of military capabilities and the ability to deter, as well as the burden of alliances, such as the risk of entrapment by emboldened allies. And here, um, there's a, a very lengthy and exhaustive scholarship that um, it goes all the way back to the 1980s, but also talks about some of the more current um, conventional wisdom and empirics about, um, about some of those concerns. The main hypothesis that stems from this literature is that allies are going to engage in moral hazard and entrap their more powerful nuclear allies in seemingly unnecessary and risky conflicts. This is again sort of the hypothesis that Michael Beckley and others are trying to, to tackle in their own research. And what this suggests is that there's an increased likelihood of disputes or the potential for an escalation and ongoing conflict. We call this the conventional hypothesis um, because it's the conventional wisdom or the common wisdom about, um, about the, uh, some of the perverse side effects of alliances. But in our book, we put forward a different argument um, uh, about the role of nuclear weapons in these alliance commitments. From our estimation, or in our logic, nuclear weapons increase a state and its allies' capability that ultimately shifts the balance of power with adversaries. While canonical bargaining theories suggest that as a result, um, these target or adversarial states should act rationally and offer concessions to avoid engaging in costly conflict, especially with a nuclear armed patron state. Thus, the effects that we should be observing are really going to be impacting diplomatic and bargaining outcomes as these adversaries are trying to avoid potential crises. Further, nuclear umbrellas should impact the distribution of states as targets offer policy concessions to de-escalate and resolve disputes. This graphic illustrates that even with the additional power from a nuclear patron, a bargaining range should still exist and that the effects of moral hazard from the client state should result in diplomatic influence, concessions, and settlements rather than from costly conflict that adversaries are keen to try to avoid. This actually leads to our two core hypotheses that we test in the first half of this manuscript. First, allies that are protected by a nuclear umbrella, here mostly we're talking about the US nuclear umbrella, are more likely to receive an increase in diplomatic influence measured by diplomatic missions from other states and subsequently to receive higher level of diplomatic missions from other states. Second, Allies protected by a US nuclear umbrella or a nuclear umbrella by a nuclear patron state are more likely to get their preferred outcomes peacefully than their counterparts that are not protected under a nuclear umbrella. So, just to give a sense of um, where this data is coming from, we're really looking at um, uh, we're really looking at a, a directed diet analysis of all states from 1950 to 2000 to differentiate the behavior of the initiator here allies and targets their adversaries to assess the logic of moral hazard. Our explanatory variable nuclear umbrellas um, measures whether or not the dyad in question received a defensive commitment from a nuclear weapons state. And during this time period, just to give you a sense of what the overall data looks like, there's about 150 defensive packs where a little less than half um, include a nuclear weapon state. 
that means that there's about a 14% likelihood that one of the initiators is protected by a nuclear umbrella. Here we show just really briefly where our data comes from and how we code each of the variables. And I'm happy to go over our, our choices in terms of data um, coding and aggregation um, in the Q&A. So perhaps surprisingly, I think that surprised you know, Neil and I a little bit as well as we were going through some of this data on diplomatic recognition. There is actually quite important variation um, in some of these politically relevant dyads. Um, as recently as last week, for example, Iran asked diplomats from Germany to leave and declared them persona non grata after Germany expelled two Iranian diplomats in the aftermath of Iran sentencing a German national to death. So there's actually been quite a few instances of um, movement in these diplomatic missions, not just in whether or not there's a presence or absence, but also in the level or the degree to which there are um, diplomats or, or other consular officers in another country. So what did we find? Um, in the next couple of slides, I'm gonna go over some of the core results from um, the key findings of our research, especially in this first half. Um, and I'm not gonna go too much into the um, into the to data, but I'm happy to answer questions that you might have in the Q&A about this. So we first explore the sort of conventional wisdom hypothesis on moral hazard and find little evidence to show that nuclear umbrellas actually embolden their allies, except for in one key uh, exception, which is one-sided use of force. What this suggests to us is that there may not be too much to support the common wisdom here that allies actually entrap their nuclear patrons in costly conflict. So we're sort of finding support to um, that bolsters the claims by Beckley, et cetera, um, and the conventional world at least. So we want to look elsewhere at some of the other effects in terms of the nuclear aspect or the nuclear um, side of the equation. And we do find support for our argument that the effects of moral hazard are actually seen in some other diplomatic, not conflict outcomes. Here, we look at diplomatic recognition generally, and then again, by level, we find that there is indeed um, some effects of, um, uh, of nuclear umbrella on the likelihood of receiving this nuclear recognition or diplomatic recognition and the level of that diplomatic recognition. And lastly, we examine the effect of nuclear umbrellas on whether the ally or its adversary will have to concede and offer a settlement. And again, our findings are supportive of our hypotheses and suggest that nuclear umbrellas actually do increase the likelihood that targets or adversaries are going to be forced to offer these peaceful settlements to avoid costly conflict with a nuclear patron. So with these findings, we're a little bit more confident that while allies of nuclear umbrellas may be slightly emboldened under very specific scenarios, especially for example, the one that led one-sided use of force or impressing their claims diplomatically or in bargaining scenarios, there's less evidence to suggest, or there's, there's no real increase in the likelihood of war. And if anything, in accord with bargaining theory, um, adversaries that are observing these defensive pacts are more likely to try to offer concessions to avoid gauge, engaging in a conflict with the nuclear weapon state. This makes sense to some degree. There's very little appetite for an escalation in conflict with nuclear weapon states. So given this, we sort of were thinking about well, what comes next then, right? So for, for observing that these institutions are not necessarily producing huge degree of entrapment or emboldenment amongst allies, and they're not necessarily increasing the likelihood of conflict, there's still some risk of that. So we wanted to examine whether or not there's um, maybe the other side of the coin here and whether or not states can actually rationally design institutions to mitigate these concerns and these potential risks. So specifically, we ask how do patron states behave um, to do, reduce their risks but still benefit from extended deterrence? Um, and we argue that patrons can actually design these institutions to or by withholding costly but important reliability enhancing provisions to create uncertainty about the credibility of their commitment and in doing so induce restraint amongst allies. 
Our logic examines the behavioral patterns of client states as a form of revealed preferences, as directly observing assurance is quite difficult, and there are clear incentives for allies to misrepresent or to be obscured about the degree to which they're feeling assured by the United States or by their patrons. Thus, we explore different avenues and different outcomes to get a sense of what's really going on um, in these allies. And we look specifically at the effects of uh, domestic military spending, the pursuit of indigenous nuclear weapons programs, and the number of alliances the ally joins, among other outcomes. I'll briefly go over um, some of the findings um, from these outcomes of interest, but I wanted to first talk a little bit about our logic and our theory for um, why we're actually observing um, some of these uh, some of these uh, things. So the effect of reliability enhancing provisions on um, the likelihood of defense funding. This is our first sort of key outcome of interest that we're, we care about. Our findings suggest that allies that receive fewer reliability enhancing provisions as stipulated in a nuclear umbrella, and just to give you a couple of examples of what these might look like, is whether or not there's the presence of a conditionality, um, military institutionalization, or economic cooperation as part of these defense paths. So when allies receive fewer of these reliability enhancing provisions in the institution or in the treaty, they're, they appear to be less assured by the commitment that is being extended by the United States or by a nuclear patron. And we observe what they're doing is they're spending greater resources in building and maintaining their own military compared to client states that are protected by nuclear umbrellas with the greater reliability enhancing provisions. And this suggests to us that if allies or if patron states are in trying to induce restraint by reducing the number of these reliability enhancing provisions, we do see some real effects in how the ally is behaving, specifically when it comes to domestic military spending. Similarly, when we look at the likelihood of nuclear proliferation amongst allies, what happens then? Our findings suggest that when patrons again are withholding some of these reliability enhancing provisions, special conditionality, military institutionalization, economic cooperation, amongst others, client states are going to respond in accord. Um, and they're more likely to be interested in pursuing nuclear weapons, especially depending on the type of provision in question. So these findings are consistent with our priors and with our expectations and are perhaps the most direct indicator of whether client states feel assured by a patron's commitment to extended nuclear deterrence. So just to give you a sense of what um, the data is, is telling us in this graph, compared to client states that are protected under nuclear security assurances with each of these provisions, Client states that are protected under nuclear security assurances where obligations are not conditional appear almost 13% more likely on average to pursue a nuclear weapon. Similarly, when patron states withhold economic cooperation from these defense and security assurances, client states are about 12% more likely to pursue nuclear weapons on average. And lastly, client states appear almost 20% more likely to pursue nuclear weapons on average when these defensive security insurances do not provide for any military institutionalization compared to security assurances that do. This really does provide us with, again, some degree of support for our theoretical priors that if you design an institution to induce restraint, what that could do is also um, change or alter the dynamic of these extended deterrence um, defensive paths. So I want to wrap up um, just in, in the remaining few minutes I have today before the Q&A with, I think, a few implications and, um, and conclusions from, uh, from this line of inquiry. Um, and I think this has been especially salient in the past year or so um, after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Um, but a lot of these implications stem from not just NATO and the Ukraine conflict, but also some of the other sort of key um, alliances that the United States has. 
First, the risk of moral hazard in client states that are protected by nuclear umbrella is, is real. Um, there is no, no sort of direct observation in, in costly conflict, but when these allies are emboldened, they do initiate one-sided crises, which are unlikely to escalate, but adversaries would prefer to offer concessions to settle the conflict than engage in war with a nuclear armed patron. But all is not lost. Right? There are ways to ensure that allies remain restrained and do not press their luck against adversaries. Patrons can design these alliances and treaties to demonstrate restraint and avoid entangling the U.S. in conflict. And to some degree, we're observing a little bit of this now. The United States is part of a multilateral alliance NATO that includes 30 member states from across North America, Europe, and, um, and, and of course, we have bilateral alliances in Asia as well. Of particular interest now is that um, many of our allies are potential targets of Russian aggression, um, including Poland and former states within um, in the Baltic region. Some of the recent discussions we've had in the policy community as well as within government about um, providing advanced military or weapons to Ukraine could have suggested that there's the pos possibility, even though Ukraine's not an ally, but it's a partner or friend of the United States, um, could suggest the potential for moral hazard from concerned NATO members uh, worried about the Russian threat and worried about the response from Russia if that were to happen. And in doing so, I think one of the key things is um, for the United States to really carefully balance between assuring allies um, like Poland without risking escalation and deterrence concerns writ large. And again, this has um, important consequences, not just for NATO, but also for other alliances that are of, of key interest to us, including the U.S.-Taiwan alliance, as well as the U.S.-South Korea alliance, carefully balancing between assurance and maintaining deterrence. is quite important and quite challenging. And this is probably going to remain at the forefront of U.S. foreign policy, especially um, now, but even moving forward as we sort of try to navigate this really careful balance in this dilemma that nuclear patrons like the United States have, as well as other countries. So with that, I will end here, and I'm very much looking forward to your questions and comments. Thank you.